with that, let's go ahead and open in prayer and we'll jump into Matthew. God in heaven, as we always do, we, we strive to have your word be the ultimate authority in our lives. We want to study the Bible, to understand it, come to, to grasps with theology that may be difficult for us to understand. But above all, understand who you are better so that we can honor you better, both within the church and also to those who are without, by being able to give an accounting of everything that we believe so that other people may believe as well. Thank you for those who are here. Pray for those who are not, for those who are traveling, those who are ill, and those who are brokenhearted. We pray for those who are dealing with loss. Help us to show grace and mercy as always because you have shown us grace and mercy always. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Matthew chapter 12. Um, just get, making sure we get a full flavor of the book. Dealing with the Gospel of Matthew. It's an evangelical book to Israel about the reality of Jesus being the Messiah and the offer of the kingdom of God as the culmination of the promises and covenants of the Old Testament. The kingdom of heaven is being offered to Israel if they would believe and return to Jehovah. Um, we've talked about this at several different entities, at several different points within the text. Uh, who is responsible for believing in Yahweh or returning to him? The people, yes, but the representatives of the people, more importantly, the leadership, the elders, the spiritual leadership, the kings. Those are the ones that have to uh, believe and call. Matthew 1 through 9, we saw as the major portion of this book as a record of Jesus's history, words and works demonstrating that he is Messiah. If all you have was Matthew 1 through 9, you should have plenty of material as a Jew to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Matthew 10 is the, is the commission of the disciples, very important passage, not only because they are becoming the shepherds of Israel during that time and receiving both authority and ability from Jesus, but also that carries over into the book of Acts. These same apostles, 11 of the 12, become the, the main vocal point for Jesus after he ascends into heaven. Of course, one is added later on. Um, you can go ahead and count with us if you'd like. I skipped to Paul when it comes to the 12. Um, the purpose of them was to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom with the verification of miracles and powers, which they do throughout the book of Acts. Um, however, the focal or the the main thrust of the message starts turning to the world as Jesus being the, the savior of the world, not just the savior of Israel. In Matthew chapter 11, it is the pinnacle of popularity. The disciples go out, everyone hears about this. John's like, you know, what's going on? I thought you were the, the, the one going to cut down Israel and, and, and come down with vengeance. What's going on? Um, Jesus tells them, what do you see? You see the, heal, the the sick healed, the lepers cleansed, the lame walk, the deaf hear, the blind see, and the gospel is preached to the poor. This uh, obviously um, calms John, reassures him of who Jesus is. But at the same time, from that point, opposition is emphasized. Matthew chapter 12 is predominantly the spiral of rejection specifically in the confrontation of the Pharisees. There's one section in Matthew 12, which is good, and that is Matthew 12, 15 through 17. Everything else, not good. Now, you can go ahead and say even, even the concept of Matthew chapter 12, 40, 46 through 50 is good, but as far as him emphasizing the spiritual uh, relationships over the physical ones, but... There's a reason why he was doing that was because he was getting opposition even from his own family. So the rejection a rejection and opposition of Jesus continues to increase. And this is emphasized in Jesus's condemnation of the Pharisees that in chapter 12, verses 30 through 32, that they will not be forgiven. We will remind ourselves of what that means when we get there. But remember, on being not forgiven is not a designation of going to heaven or hell in this book will they probably will they end up in hell 
most likely. But in this situation, it is that is not what he's pronouncing upon them. So, so they're not mutually exclusive. We're not saying that they're not uh, not eternally damned, but that is not what the phrase means. Now, these two chapters, 11 and 12, are between two discourses. Chapter 10, cost and benefit of being disciples. And chapter 13, the parables of Jesus, which I've told you several times I can't wait to get to. They're fun. They're enjoyable. They, a lot of symbolism and people are like, what does this mean? And it's so cool because of the, a lot of the imagery and people want to know. And I like to explain it to them because I don't think it's that difficult. It's just that we come up with a lot of, a lot of um, baggage associated with parables. And so we want to make sure we understand them to the best of our ability. Um, chapters 11 and 12 continue with the affirmation of Jesus to John the Baptizer, but conclude with both opposition and rejection. The two chapters have many snippets. I think we're going to see that very clearly again in, in Matthew 12. They're not necessarily chronological stories, this and this and this and this. It's like Matthew took a picture from Mark and said, let me go ahead and give you several different situations that kind of detail out Jesus' acceptance and his rejection. And he obviously is writing it with the emphasis that from this point on, from the pinnacle of his of his popularity, he is being opposed and rejected. It starts out with John's question. Uh, John speaks about uh, Jesus speaks about John specifically. Jesus condemns the cities. He rejects uh, John and Jesus, and he denounces them. Um, and last week we dealt with "Come to me" and the, the kingdom offer that he is telling the people who have believed to come to me, and I will give you rest. This is not a an announcement to individuals who are unsaved, but rather to the saved disciples of Jesus during that time. We got to be very careful with how we use language, specifically in Matthew, and trying to uh, use that language for the lost of, of this world, of this uh, of this administration, this economy. Now we're going to get into point five: Jesus, Lord of the Sabbath. That's Matthew chapter twelve, verses one through fourteen. To which um, I think it's it's actually quite simple. We just want to make sure we kind of cover all our bases and and really make and, and understand to the best of our ability. Um, afterwards, we'll deal with many follow Jesus, and there's a prophecy fulfilled, uh, specifically uh, dealing with Isaiah um, 42 and, uh, and and how that is understood. And we'll cover that next week. Uh, may not take the entire class, but we will see how long it takes us. Then we get into the condemnation of the Pharisees' blasphemy. 22, uh, basically through 37. And it's a it's a um, very poignant passage of scripture. This may take us a couple of weeks because I don't want to leave any stone unturned. We cannot just leave it there and hope that you all get it. We want to make sure we explain it to the best of our ability. Uh, point number eight, no more signs except Jonah. And again, we're going to have to deal with some, uh, uh, not difficulties, but... Um, baggage that we bring. I'm going to, probably going to show you a couple of snippets of videos of individuals that say, here's the sign of Jonah, um, which has a lot of different flaws. Okay. And finally, spiritual relationships versus are greater than physical relationships is the last portion. It's not that difficult of a passage. We've covered that, I believe, in Mark, but we will make sure that we explain it to the best of our ability when we get there. So not much more. But it may take us a little bit of time to get through verses 22 through uh, 45 with explanations, making sure, again, we cover all those bases to the best of our ability. This section, however, not difficult. Uh, Matthew 12, 1 through 14, Jesus, Lord of the Sabbath, and um, basically you want to subtitle that, Pharisees' Opposition Increase. Let's begin by reading verses 1 through 14. Then we're going to take a little different approach. We're going to look at the narrative, then go back to two statements that Jesus makes um, and deal with those uh, particular statements specifically. So we'll take a look at the general and then get down to the specific, looking at verses 6 and 8. Beginning in verse 1, it states, at that time, that should give you another ring of a bell because we dealt with that last week as well, at that time indicates something. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples became hungry and began to peep, pick the heads of grain and eat. But when the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples do not do what is lawful on the Sabbath. 
But he said to them, have you not read what David did when he became hungry? He and his companions, how he entered the house of God and they ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for him to eat, nor for those with him, but for the priests alone. Or have you not read the law? That on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple break the Sabbath are innocent. But I say to you that something greater than the temple is here. But if you had known what this means, I desire compassion and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Departing from there, he went to the synagogue. And a man was there who had, had, whose hand was withered. And they questioned Jesus, asking, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So that they might accuse him. And he said to them, What man is there among you who has a sheep, and it falls into the pit on the Sabbath? Will he not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable, then, is a man than a sheep? So then, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? It is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and it was restored to normal like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him as to how they might destroy him. Now, remember, we talked about this last time. At that time, is a change of subject. It's not necessarily chronological. In fact, if you want to find out where this was chronologically, it's probably very early in the situation of picking grain. It's in Luke 6. It's in Mark 2. Um, there, the, the, he, Matthew puts these two accounts together, not because they're sequential, not because they're, um, they happen right next to each other, but because it has the same theme. It's the Sabbath. Now, if you're in, on, coming on Sunday and listening to Mark, you may think that in Matthew, we have covered several different instances where the Sabbath was mentioned. In fact, the word Sabbath, this is the first time it's mentioned in the book of Matthew. And it's the only time that confrontation in the book of Matthew about the Sabbath happens. I find that very interesting because Mark, it happens, I believe, in four different locations, Luke another three or four different times, John another four or five times that the Sabbath is being dealt with. So you, you, you look at it and go, well, you know, you think that Matthew would be more about the Sabbath than any other book because it is about Jewish law, Jewish uh, covenant, um, and specifically something that the Jews really hold on to. But Matthew's unconcerned with it. He covers it in 14 verses, and that's the last time we deal with Jesus and the Sabbath and the questions about the Sabbath and what he's doing on the Sabbath. The passage begins with Jesus and his disciples walking through the grain fields. You found this picture? I like it. They're walking through the grain fields, and they become hungry. And they start eating the, the grains of, of wheat. Now it's the Sabbath. What is also unlawful to do, according to Jewish custom, on the Sabbath? Walk longer than a, uh, basically a mile or so. Now, were they walking that far? Were they going from one, one small house to another? It doesn't say how far they're going. I just find that interesting because typically when you see farmlands, you're going to see that there's, you know, a good distance of farmland in between. And you would think that they're violating the Sabbath by just walking because that was part of their... They have a certain amount of uh, distance they can travel on the Sabbath day. But who's with them? Now, remember, they're not technologically advanced. They don't have telescopes. They don't have binoculars. The Pharisees see them. Why? They're probably following Jesus, trying to figure out exactly, find ways to be able to accuse him. Hey, we're walking along here, and so my 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 first question is if 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 they're walking longer than a Sabbath day journey, which just doesn't say, then what are the Pharisees doing? It's inconsequential. I just found that kind of curious. Why are they out in the field in the first place? But that's that's neither here nor there. The second thing that happens on the Sabbath is the man with the withered hand, right? Stretches out, becomes healed. So let's go ahead and deal with that at a, at, you know, later on. Let's go ahead and just understand that there's two circumstances. Let's deal with one at a time. Dealing with the disciples, picking grain and eating it, 
and then getting accused by the Pharisees that they are not doing what is lawful on the Sabbath. What exactly is the problem? Now, in the law, there are strict ordinances about the Sabbath. But most of what you would think is in the law about the Sabbath is actually within the Talmud. Okay? There's one instance where something specific is mentioned. But if you go through the text itself, we're going to take a little trip through Exodus if you want to try to follow along. I have it on the screen. So it's only a couple of verses per, per area. Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 through 11, it doesn't really give us a whole lot of detail as to what exactly the restrictions are. Matthew 20, verse 8, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor, do all your work. But on the seventh day, it is the Sabbath of the Lord, your God. In it, you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter or your male or your female servant or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. Nobody is to do, your, do work. Exodus 23, 12, once again says it, For in six days the Lord made heavens and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Sorry, that's 2011. 23, 12, six days you are to work on the seventh day or shall cease from your labor, so that your ox and your donkey may rest. The sons of your female slaves, as well as your stranger, may refresh themselves. So, interestingly enough, no work is to be performed so that people can rest. And what? What else are you doing on the Sabbath day? It doesn't say go to church. Basically, it's just an honor. It's a remembrance of God and his importance. Exodus 31, 12 through 14, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, but as for you, speak to the sons of Israel saying, you shall surely observe my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Therefore, you are to observe the Sabbaths, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death, for whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. So there's two different penalties. You profane it, dead. That's the strict punishment for profaning the Sabbath. Doing work on it not, is not necessarily profaning it, right? So there's two different situations here. So I'd be cut off from among his people, basically kicked out of Israel. You're no longer part of God's chosen nation. You're kicked out. Specifically in Exodus 35, 2 through 3, you have... Six days of work shall be done, but on the seventh is a Sabbath. You shall not kindle a fire in any of your dwellings on the Sabbath day. No, no fire making. Now, you have to look at the context and find out why. This is dealing with making a meal. Okay, so kindling a fire is not just staying warm. It's about making a meal. So you're not to cook. You're supposed to eat whatever you have. Uh, specifically, they have manna. They were supposed to get twice as much manna on the day before the sabbath so that they have plenty of food on the sabbath and there's one situation where the sabbath was violated by a by a person and that's in numbers chapter 5 verses 12 through 15. speak to the sons of israel and say to them if any man's wife goes astray that's not where i'm no, 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 no. numbers not five okay i'll just tell you the story since this is not the right passage. That is an interesting one, but it's not about the Sabbath. A man was found picking up sticks, logs, firewood. And he is found, they brought him out, and they stoned him for picking up wood. Why would be picking up wood be considered to be work? Maybe he was just, you know, Probably because he didn't have enough food and he was about ready to kindle a fire to make food. That would be my assumption based upon the context there. There are other situations throughout all the prophets because Israel did not keep the Sabbath. And God is angry with them because they're not honoring God. But when it comes down to the actual restrictions within the law, that's all we have. Man picked up sticks, don't kindle fire, don't work. 
So in the Talmud, which is the verbal law, the oral law, traditions, capital T, it is a body of work that they had. There are 39 interpretations of what work is. Now, some of them are silly. Some of them make sense. 39 actions are classified as work. Here are some. So each one would be classified within themselves. Plowing, reaping, harvesting, threshing, sifting, grinding, lighting a fire, you know, those types of things were all considered work and labor. You know what's not there, interestingly enough, is walking. You know, they always had the Sabbath day journey. I don't say that. It says don't work. So you have this um, interpretation. Now, that, now, would anybody disagree with these things being work? No, I, I don't think I would. What would I disagree with? Well, with later on, after the Talmud and other rabbinic writings, that if you spit on the ground, now this is one of Eric's favorite stories, so it's obviously one of my favorite stories. If you spit on the ground and the dirt moves, dirt moves, you just plowed. That's silly, right? So plowing, yes, you spitting on the ground and creating the earth to move. Is that really what we're talking about here? Now, are there is there work that's actual work that does not violate the law? As far as the Sabbath goes, can you do some work on the Sabbath that's not considered a violation? What do you think? I'm asking the question, so you may you probably go probably, but I don't know what you're talking about, right? Well, you would you would understand it if you understood the, the temple services, because the priestly activities you're working, specifically you're consistently killing and grilling, you're you're, you're cooking consistently in the tabernacle and in the temple. You're actually baking bread. Regularly, you have to have the show bread every day. It doesn't last that long. So they're constantly having to make show bread. And so all the different activities that they're doing and carrying and moving and doing all kinds of stuff, and they're working. That is their labor. They don't cease in doing so. And also there are special exceptions. So there are normally things that would consider to be a violation, but because it's being done in the temple or in the tabernacle, so they're both the same thing, just one's temporary, one's permanent, they're considered to be okay. Now, this is found within the law, uh, Exodus 30, uh, Exodus, between Exodus 35 and 40, um, also in Deuteronomy, Leviticus, has all of these different duties that are done every day. It is no exception for the Sabbath. But one of the most fascinating stories that we all know as children actually has God instructing the nation of Israel to violate the Sabbath. Anybody know what it is? As far as as far as what the Pharisees would consider to be violation of the Sabbath. That would be found in Joshua chapter 6. What's happening in Joshua chapter 6? It's Jericho. The Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and its valiant warriors. You shall march around the cities, all the men of war, circling the city once. You shall do so for six days. On the seventh day, you shall rest. No. On the seventh day, seven priests shall carry seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. Then on the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow trumpets. It shall be on, it, and, and so basically what happens? They go in there, and not only that, but they go and kill everybody. Now, is the, is the seventh day also the Sabbath? Maybe the fourth day was the Sabbath. But where's the rest? They're at war. So wartime, and there's other different examples of that, where they fought for days on end. Where's the Sabbath? exceptions so back to matthew chapter 12 let's take a look at something here very important 
Jesus defends his disciples. Now, it's interesting because it didn't say that Jesus picked grain. Maybe he wasn't hungry. Maybe he was simply using them as an object lesson. Why did the disciples pick grain? Did he? Did they have permission? Doesn't say. It's a lot of different things we can assume here, but it doesn't really say that. But when he is asked by the Pharisees about the actions of the disciples in picking grain, he defends their actions in two ways. First, he defends the disciples example by example using David and the priests. In verses 3 through 5, he uses David when he is on the run and he has a companions with him and they get hungry. And there's a, and it's not the temple and it's not a, it's not a synagogue. They didn't have synagogues yet. But there's basically a house of the Lord and their showbread, which is only for the priests. They go in there and say, give us the bread. And they go, it's not for you. They go, we're hungry. They said, have some. And they ate. So he used an example of David. Now, are the Pharisees willing to go ahead and say, well, David was a sinner? David sinned in that situation along with all his people. Well, if that were the case, if you sinned that way against the showbread, against the, tab the, te the temple and the tabernacle, what is it, what's supposed to happen to you? Specifically, if you enter in the, in the, in the holy place, considered to be a sacred place, and eat sacred things, you're supposed to die. But they didn't. Then he explains the principle of the Sabbath. Now, this is where a little bit more poignant for us because, okay, there's an example of David doing something. Now, Jesus did not conclude. He didn't sin. He wasn't condemned. Nothing like that. However, that is the implication. But if you want to get to the real heart of the matter, verses 6 through 8 and 11 through 12, give details as to the principle behind the thing. So he explains the principles of the Sabbath. In the case of David, okay, was appropriate. Why is it appropriate for Jesus to use David specifically in this situation? Number one, because they ate something they weren't supposed to eat. David and his companions ate something they weren't supposed to eat. According to the Pharisees, the disciples ate something they weren't supposed to eat, or in the manner, in the manner they weren't supposed to eat it. Number two, it involved a sanctity issue. They're violating something that's considered to be holy. But there is a situation that supersedes it. And it not only involved David, but his followers. So it's not just dealing with one particular person who may consider it to be, well, David has an exception. Well, not just David, his followers did, his, his entire company that was following after him also was exempted. exempted. Now, verse 5 comes in, and we already saw that when we talked about the exceptions to the law. We already know that there's some with the priests. Or do you have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple break the Sabbath and are innocent? Now, I find this very interesting. Why? Because like a lot of people, I've read the law concerning what is available on the Sabbath. And I could have sworn to you that there was some provision in there about reaping and sowing and gathering and, and threshing within the text, to which I was surprised I did not find any. I'm going, wait a second. Am I just remembering tradition? Where is this in the text? It's not there. And so my, my thought was that, okay, there's a law against threshing. There's a law against harvesting. There's a law against you know, sifting the weeds and whatnot, because that's labor. But they're not really doing that because it's individual. However, what do we have? We, we, we don't have Jesus saying, you're misinterpreting the law. In fact, you can argue that because of Jesus' silence on that issue, that he's actually saying, normally, you'd be right. Potentially. One or the other, I'm like, I'm not, I don't have a problem with it because I think it would be, I think we have an answer to the question. 
but I found that very interesting. Are they really violating technically the law? I think you can argue that they are. However, we could also argue, because the law doesn't say that specifically, that simply grabbing a piece of grain and rubbing it together and getting the kernel and eating it is not a violation because they're not really harvesting. They're not working. They're just eating. I mean, is this work? What's the difference between if you had a, a, a kernel of, of, of unchaffed wheat, of, cha of chaffed wheat, and, that's, and you, you're going to go ahead and rub it to get the wheat kernel out? What's the difference? Not much. So the question that I have is, did the Pharisees have a wrong understanding of the law? If they did, it's not expressed here. And it is expressed elsewhere. In Mark chapter 7, verses 6 through 13, We've just been going over this recently, right? And he said to them, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites. Because he said, you're not, you're washing, you're eating food with that with unwashed hands. You're breaking the law. And he goes, what law? What are you talking about? You neglect the commandment of God and you hold to the tradition of men. He was also saying to them, you are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. Dealing with Corbin, right? That if you say, hey, whatever I have, I've given it to God. It's dedicated to God. And your parents become in need. And you go, sorry, I've already given it to God. What would God want rather? You think God needs that? So the Pharisees say, well, if you've already dedicated it, it's ours now. You cannot say what I've dedicated to God. I'm going to go ahead and use it for my parents. And he says, thus, you invalidate the word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down, and you do many things such as that. So there are plenty of times in which their traditions are superseding the word of God. So Jesus could have said, um, your tradition says, don't pick a piece of wheat. But that's not what the law says. He could have said that, but he doesn't. I'm not saying that that's the case, but it's just, it's not here. He also does this in Mark 2, right? Where the actual situation is repeated, but there's an, an additional statement that is being made concerning the Sabbath. So this is, this is following the exact situation in Mark 2. And Jesus said to the Pharisees, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. What does that mean? That there is a more important principle than not following your 39 rules about keeping the Sabbath. You see, the consecration of the Sabbath was for what purpose? Now, there, there are times in which, in the law, it says to do something, to which I go, I have no idea why that's there. Right? As far as a standard goes. We can guess at times, but we, also, we oftentimes don't know. Like, I don't know why they have to have blue tassels. Is that just to look different, to look unique? I don't know. The breastplate thing. You know, some people think that's like a communication device. It's like Darth Vader's little chest thing going on. Like, no, no. It, why is it there then? I, I, I don't know exactly, but I know one thing. They look different. And so because they look different, a lot of times that draws a distinction between what God is telling them to do and what other nations just make up in their own heads. But when it comes down to something like the Sabbath, we have enough information within the text to determine why it's given. And it's two reasons. The consecration of the Sabbath was so that man would stay focused on God and give everyone a regular rest and not become worn out. In fact, this idea of resting not only applied to man, but also to beasts, and not only to beasts, but also to land. There's supposed to be a regular rest of the land. That's part of it. It says, because things get worn out, things get used, resources get used up. Don't do that. Rest yourselves. I'm not sure about you, but have you ever worked seven days straight? I know David hasn't. David hasn't. 
got a day off in a while. <laughs> right? There's there's times in which we've worked. I at one time when I when, when Leanna was first born, um, I decided to pick up a second job, and I worked seven days straight for six months. At the end of six months, what happens? I'm I'm exhausted. I need to do something different. I'm not getting a day rest. So there are times in which you understand that the principle that God has set up understands that there's there's a, there's a need there for rest. But the consecration was that to stay focused on God. So let me ask you a question. What is the principle behind a violation? If you're going to violate something like the Sabbath, which obviously was very important to God, right, including some of the judgments of God against Israel, was because they were not keeping the Sabbath. So if, if there's a principle behind it, a reason to violate the, 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 the technical terms of the Sabbath, what would they be? I'll go ahead and say it once. We'll read some verses, and we'll go ahead and say it again. What seems to be the principle when it comes to the Sabbath is that if it is better for man to do something on the Sabbath that would normally be a violation, then it's okay to violate the Sabbath. We've already read one of them, but we'll come. We'll go ahead and repeat it in just a second. Mark chapter 3, verse 4. Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save a life or to kill? If you had to work to save a life on the Sabbath, was it right? Yes, because it's designed for man's benefit. So therefore, if you are at war and the invading army comes in on the Sabbath, you go, sorry, can't fight, it's the Sabbath, I need to go rest. What would happen? dead it's bad news so you're actually causing harm by not defending yourself on the sabbath or as god instructed them when they're invading canaan you know what there are times in which there were uh, straight weeks of fighting why because they're doing what god wanted them to do so it's number two if they're honoring god In Luke chapter 13, verses 14 through 16, it says, The synagogue official, ignorant, uh, I, I've always missed him this up, very upset because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, began saying to the crowd in response, There are six days in which work should be done, so come during them and get healed. In other words, he's mad because somebody got healed on the Sabbath. He goes, Listen, you have six days to come get healed. But not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead him away to water? Isn't that work? Can you just do work? And this woman, a daughter of Abraham, as she is, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, should she not have been released from this bond on the Sabbath day? That's good. Why are you frustrated over somebody being healed? Because the Sabbath was meant for a good for man. A time of remembrance, a time of rest. And of course, in Matthew chapter 12, verses 11 and 12, which we've already read, it's in our text. Is there not one of you who has a sheep and it falls into the pit on the Sabbath? Will you not take hold of it and lift it out? Isn't that work? You make exceptions for ox and sheep, donkeys, but not for people. How much more valuable, then, is a man than sheep? Jesus argues that the preservation of human life takes priority over Sabbath rest. Jesus also argues that activities of God-honoring service take priority over Sabbath rest. So if you take that right there, okay? <clears throat> now, the disciples walking in the fields, are they preserving life? No, but what are they doing? 
they're going where Jesus is going. Their activity is what? Now, Jesus could have said, I'm staying home, it's the Sabbath, but he's not. The disciples didn't drive the train. Jesus did. Jesus goes, let's go take a walk. And the disciples goes, okay. They got hungry, and they ate. Now, did they eat knowing that it was okay, okay, to, to violate the Sabbath at that point? Or did they just get hungry and eat? I don't know. Sometimes the disciples, you're not always, you're always going, I'm not exactly sure these people are the sharpest tools in the shed, right? But they're honoring God. They're doing God's work. They're honoring Jesus Christ in service to him and following him, literally. And therefore, the Sabbath did not apply. They're doing, for lack of a better term, priestly duties as if they were in the temple. And therefore, what they had to accomplish in order to be able to do so. And when they became hungry, I don't think they go, hmm, I can, I'm, I'm a little peckish, right? They become hungry. So they ate. Now, to demonstrate this, this lack of understanding, what does Jesus do? He quotes Hosea. Now, I want you to turn to Hosea chapter 6. Hosea chapter 6. Hosea, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea. Hosea chapter 6. We're going to read verses 4 through 6, and we're going to go ahead and just reference this a little bit as we move forward. So Hosea chapter 6, verses 4 through 6, is this. What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? For your loyalty is like a morning cloud, and like the dew which goes away early. Therefore I have honed them in places by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth. And the judgments on you are like the light that goes forth. For I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice and the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Now Jesus asks in chapter in Matthew chapter 12 verse 5. Don't I'm just going to put it on the screen for you. Have you not read in the law? Now is is he is do you, what do you think Jesus understands about the the act of the Pharisees? They're probably not reading a whole lot. He also asked them in 12:7 if you had known, have you not read about David? Have you not read in the law? Have you not understood? And in John chapter 5, what does he say about them? If you would have believed Moses, you would have believed me. So what's clear to me is that the Pharisees really do not know the scriptures. They don't really know it. They know their traditions. Whenever I hear the word traditions, I always think of fiddle on the roof. Tradition. Even if they had read it, they don't understand it. And even if they do understand it, they don't believe it. Jesus is calling them out, and I return. Have you not read this? And I can imagine a few Pharisees going, wait, what, David? What did David do? <laughs> Doesn't say that. I can just imagine it, right? So first and foremost, going back to Hosea, Hosea is the prophet who was told to go marry a harlot. Now, I don't know about you, but that would you would assume that God telling Hosea to go marry a harlot would violate some type of law. Right? No, it doesn't really, but <clears throat> it's not exactly a good thing to do. And he does this to illustrate to Israel that God had to be married to a harlot nation. They are constantly cheating on God. The nation referred to in verse 4 is Ephraim. Now, Ephraim and Judah, basically, Ephraim was the main a nation, a name, main tribe in Israel. So Israel oftentimes is referred to as Ephraim. Um, I didn't want to tell some friends of ours that, that they're named their child after the bad nation. But... Ephraim was not a very good uh, tribe, and it refers to Israel and the northern tribes. Judah um, is obviously the southern. So when you put them both together, it's the whole nation. 
And he says, what shall I do with you? And then he, and he says to them, I prefer loyalty over sacrifice. The word loyalty is the word chesed. Chesed is loving kindness and refers to the love and dedication to what? I prefer chesed over sacrifice. And what he's saying here is that he prefers your dedication and love to my covenant than sacrifice. What would God rather have an individual who, because of circumstance, cannot sacrifice appropriately, but he has a constant ador adoration and love for God and his covenant? Or somebody goes, ah, God wants me to do this again? Fine. Uh, fire, eat, throw away. Yay. Can we go home now? What would he rather? We know the answer to that. And so what we have to understand, now, if the person is dedicated, he'll do the practice. But the intent is always emphasized over the practice. The thought behind it, what's going on. The idea in verse 7 is that they have not been loyal to the Mosaic Covenant. Not because they failed in the mechanics of the sacrificial process, but because they did not understand it or believe it. They didn't follow the point of the sacrifice. The Jews offered sacrifices, but it was all just religious ritual. They did not believe the true intent of the sacrifice, nor the true intent of the law, or more specifically, the covenant. Back to Matthew. In Matthew chapter uh, 12, the narrative is simple. It's it's really, you just read and go, huh, that's interesting. You know, it's you, you see what I said. They're breaking supposedly or potentially true, truly the law of the Sabbath. But there's exceptions to that. But there are two statements that are made, which I'm sure for the Pharisees and even for people who are with Jesus going, wait, wait, what? Wait, what? What did you say? Because in Matthew 12, he says that David entered the, 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 the house of God. And that the people who are working in the temple break the Sabbath, but they don't break the law. But I say to you, something greater than the temple is here. Mm, that's pretty audacious. The interesting because if we remember our lessons back on the temple and the tabernacle. So the tabernacle and temple, same thing, one temporary, one permanent. The, so when you have lessons on the tabernacle, it is, mess, it is lessons on the temple, just it moves. Okay? The tabernacle, you have activities, you have symbols, you have actions, the tabernacle itself. And if you remember back during the time of Exodus, they didn't have the book of Genesis they didn't have the book of Leviticus. They, they were living the book of Exodus. They didn't have Deuteronomy yet. And obviously they don't have the rest of the Old Testament. Some people say they might have Job. I'm like, uh, maybe, maybe, don't know. So what Bible did they have? They had the tabernacle. That was, they would study the tabernacle. And they would go to the priests and go to Aaron and go to Moses and go, what does this mean? What does this mean? What does this mean? And it's suspected, although not specifically, that Jesus is represented in all the different elements. Again, we, we've, we've lost that to history, and anything we say is basically conjecture. But that makes sense because their theology, and I would say even their Christology, comes from the temple, the tabernacle. And yet, what is it? What does Jesus say? Something greater than the temple is here. Because what Moses wrote was about me. And I'm here. What did Moses write about? The temple, the tabernacle? And what's here? I'm here. Which means the culmination of everything he wrote about is standing in front of you. Now, you don't have the reaction to this, but that's pretty crazy. You would think there would be Matthew go, and they went, oh, how dare you? 
something. Now, you do have that kind of, but it's later, right? Then you have another statement in verse 8. The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Hmm. We could read that and go, I know exactly what that means. Because we've taken a look at the Son of Man. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 20, Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes, the birds have airs and nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Matthew 9, 6. But so that you may know the Son of Man has authority to honor earth and forgive sins. So he says, call, calls himself Son of Man, Son of Man. In Mark, we went with Son of Man quite, quite a bit. And we looked at this and said, where does it come from? Well, we, we said it came from uh, Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. I kept looking in thy visions, and behold, with the cloud of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. It was well established that the Son of Man from Daniel 7, 13 is the Messiah presenting himself before God, the Father. And people don't understand what this means. But it's very difficult for them to deny that the term Son of Man is, in fact, a Messianic reference. So the Son of Man being Lord of the Sabbath, this means that he has authority over the Sabbath. He can get rid of it. He can change it as he sees fit. He can allow people to violate it when he deems it's necessary. So the, the statement itself in Matthew chapter 12 indicates that he is kind of like letting the, the, the Pharisees say they're violating the Sabbath. And he goes, so? I'm Lord of the Sabbath. I do what I want. And I go, oh, that, that, may, that kind of makes sense. He is the authority. He is the creator God. He gave his example of resting on the seventh day. And the fact that Jesus did not condemn his disciples for the violation... Um, indicates that he had given his okay. Do it. Even if it was technically a violation. These statements indicate that Jesus is letting the Pharisees know exactly who he claims to be. They would have known he's claiming to be the Messiah. However, there is an alternate interpretation of the Son of Man reference. And to understand that, you need to go back to Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. For he did not subject to angels the world to come, concerning which he is speaking. But one has testified somewhere saying, what is man that you remember him? Or the son of man that you are concerned about him? And the term son of man indicates mankind. You have made him, that is, this, that is man, a little lower than the angels for now. You have crowned him with glory and honor. You have appointed him over the works of your hands. You have put all things under subjection under his feet. For in subjecting all things to him, that is man, he left nothing that is not subject to him. But now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. Mankind was supposed to be in charge. But they look weak and feeble compared to the angels. But in eternity, when we get glory, we're going to have all things subjected to us. And not only will we have authority, we will also have ability. And so, based upon that, it is possible, and I put out possible, I, I don't agree with it, but I did not want to just leave this alone, that the Son of Man is a reference to mankind in verse, in chapter 12, verse 8. The phrase, Lord of the Sabbath, would mean that mankind has greater value than the Sabbath. I don't like it personally. But it does fit theologically, especially when you take into consideration the context in Matthew chapter 12. What is he saying? Man's more important than the Sabbath. And therefore, if man, needs, if man needs to take care of man, heal, feed, whatever it may be, then Sabbath takes second fiddle to that. Because in Mark, what does it say? That man was not made for the Sabbath, but Sabbath for man. Now, because of the statement in verse 6, I believe that the Messianic reference takes precedence, um, especially since he says something greater than the temple is with you. That's not man. That's Jesus, 100%.
And so the Son of Man reference, I believe, as being Lord, the Lord of the Sabbath, and it's the Son of Man, I believe this is talking about Jesus. The conclusion of this count and encounter in Matthew is actually in Matthew chapter 12, verse 14. Now, the literal translation is the Pharisees left. They held a council against him so that they would destroy him. The word destroy is apolumai. Now, the word apolumai is very interesting because it means cause destruction. It means perish, die, or ruin, or cause to fail at the objective. In fact, the word to lose is actually appropriate as well. In Matthew, it's used for the lost sheep of Israel, the word lost. It stands for die physically in Matthew 8.25. We're dying to fail at a goal. Matthew 10.42, which is just a page, couple pages over, where they do not get their reward. They won't lose it. Same idea. So when we take a look at a word like apolumai, we have to make sure that we actually deal with it within the context. What did the Pharisees want to do? They wanted to stop Jesus. If that meant killing him, so be it. But more than that, they wanted to kill him. In fact, the crucifixion, why crucify him? What was their goal in crucifixion? They could have stoned him. They could have assassinated him. What was the point of the crucifixion? It was to cause the, the apostles to go, I don't want that. I don't want to follow in those shoes. It was meant as not only to stop the head, but it was also meant as a deterrent to his followers to stop his agenda. That is what they mean by destroy him. Destroy him utterly. Not just kill him, but to destroy everything that is about him. And of course, they apolumai. They fail at their objective. They are destroyed themselves. To conclude, when you take a look at Matthew 12, what was Jesus' objective? He knows the opposition is growing. He knows the end game, yet he continued. The fact that Jesus suffered at the cross is clear. We know this. But what we don't often see is the heartache he has in dealing with these morons. And I say that word moron literally. They're idiots. They have not read. They do not understand. They do not believe, yet, they're, yet you're the teacher of Israel? Heartbreaking. This is the people who are his chosen people. And yet, they do not believe, they do not understand, they don't even read it. We need to appreciate all the sacrifices of Jesus, not just the one on the cross. That's obvious. But to understand that the God of creation come down as a man and have to deal with constant opposition and frustration. It's probably more than any of us could bear. But he did it for us. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your word. Help us to read, help us to understand, and help us to believe. Let us learn from the mistakes of others and heed to what you have us to do. We thank you for those things. We, we, we appreciate all that you've done for us. We thank you for this example of Jesus Christ and how we are to understand the principles of things, not just do things mindlessly. We appreciate you, love you. To Jesus' name we pray. Amen.